Today we're going to talk about the reading that we do on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. The first day of Rosh Hashanah we read chapter 21 of Genesis, which tells of the story of the birth of Isaac, Isaac's weaning, and the banishment of Ishmael. And the second day of Rosh Hashanah we read the following chapter, chapter 22 of Genesis, which tells a very troubling and very difficult to comprehend episode of the binding of Isaac at this juncture. Isaac is 37 years old, according to most of the commentators. And God tells Abraham, your son, your son that you prayed over so intently, the son who was born miraculously after you were 100 years old, Sarah was 90 years old, the son that I told you is going to be your true heir, your true progeny, the son when his spiritual development was threatened by Ishmael, that caused Ishmael to be banished, to be evicted, that same son you take him and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. And this is troubling for, for all sorts of reasons. There's the obvious paradox of the fact that Isaac was declared to be the true heir. Now Isaac is going to be offered as a sacrifice. In addition, we know that Abraham, he arose amid all kinds of idolatry. And some of those idolaters that Abraham railed against were ones that believed in child sacrifice. They would offer the child as a sacrifice to the pagans. And now Abraham is ordered to do so himself. Yet we see that Abraham is eager and willing to do it and had to be forced to stop at the very last moment. And our angle when we study this is going to be trying to understand what the connection here is between the themes, the ideas, the concepts of Rosh Hashanah and to try to deepen the connection between the Torah reading and the very powerful day, the Day of Judgment that is upcoming. So it begins with an interesting preface. And it happened after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he replied, here I am. Please take your son, your only one whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Bring him up there as an offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So it begins the narrative of the binding of Isaac, and it was after these things. What things is it talking about? It's not so clear. So Rashi gives us two explanations based upon the Talmud. The first explanation is that this is after the words of the Satan. Why? Because in the previous day, the previous chapter, we read how when Isaac was weaned, Abraham made a huge party, a huge celebration, invited everyone to come participate. Yet, the Satan noted that Abraham did not offer even one sacrifice for God. And therefore, the Satan tells God, Abraham's not so special. He wants to celebrate Isaac, but he's not celebrating you. He's not appreciating you. He's not offering you a sacrifice to you. And therefore, this heavenly being, the Satan, the angel whose job it is to arouse judgment against humanity, is telling God that Abraham's not so special. And after that conversation, this event happened. And God responded, Rashi tells us, that Abraham did it all for his son, after all. This whole weaning celebration party was for his son. Says God, if I tell Abraham to go offer his son as a sacrifice for me, he will not stop that. And thus, after those words, means after the dialogue, the conversation between Satan and God, after that, God said, okay, let's test Abraham to see indeed if he's up to the test, if he's willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to please me. That's the first explanation that Rashi offers. The second explanation is that this comes after a conversation not between God and the Satan, but between Isaac and Ishmael. At that time... Ishmael had already reunited with Abraham, and Ishmael was telling Isaac, you're not so special, because I, after all, I was 13 when I was circumcised, because when Abraham was 86, Ishmael was born, and when Abraham was 99, Abraham was instructed to circumcise himself, and he circumcised himself and his son Ishmael and the rest of the people of his household. And therefore, says Ishmael, I'm better than you, Isaac, because even though I was 13 years old, and it had some sense to me, I still didn't stop. I, did, I still did not object to being circumcised. But you, Isaac, you were eight days old. You didn't know any better. And therefore, I'm greater than you. That's what Ishmael 
tells Isaac. And Isaac responded, you're so special. You're lording over me because of the fact that you had more self-sacrifice with one of your organs. If God tells me to sacrifice my whole body, my whole life for him, I will not object. And thus, after Isaac's declaration that he's willing to give up his whole life for God, after that conversation, God says to Abraham, okay, let's see if that indeed is true. And he made a test for Abraham to go offer Isaac as a sacrifice. So this is a very interesting introduction to this story. Now, I think the first explanation that there was a conversation between God and the Satan, it really warrants an explanation. The Satan tells God that Abraham, he did this whole party. He invited everyone to go celebrate the weaning of Isaac, and he didn't offer a sacrifice for God. And God says, well, he's really dedicated to me and I'll prove it to you. But how indeed do we understand Abraham's conduct? Why did he not indeed offer sacrifices to God? Isn't that appropriate? When you're thankful of God, shouldn't you offer him sacrifices? We know that Abraham had offered sacrifices in other instances, sacrifices to God. But here, when Isaac is weaned, Isaac is maturing, Abraham is appreciative, Abraham makes a feast, Abraham makes a banquet, and doesn't offer a sacrifice for God. So, yes, God proved Abraham's allegiance and loyalty to him by asking him to do the Binding of Isaac episode. But why did Abraham not initially offer a sacrifice to God during the banquet to celebrate Isaac's weaning? In addition, the context doesn't really seem to flow. The Satan says, Abraham's not so dedicated to you. Look, he didn't offer a sacrifice to you. He was just happy and celebrating with his with his son's weaning party. And God tells him, well, I'll suggest to Abraham, I'll command Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. What is the connection between the menu and Isaac's weaning party and God's request to Abraham to sacrifice his son? So I want to suggest an answer that really gets to the heart of the story. The whole story is so troubling. Abraham is the paragon of kindness. He's bringing morality. He's bringing goodness to the world. He's teaching the world about God. And yet he's about to embark on a completely cruel mission. He's going to murder his own son. Abraham is about to commit the unconscionable crime of filicide. And yes, of course, God tells him to him, but still, how do we understand what exactly is happening? What is the infrastructure, the architecture of, of this decision, this test, and Abraham going ahead with it? What does it reveal to us about Abraham? So my grandfather of blessed memory, he used to always say the following theme. There's a prayer that we say every Shabbos morning by the morning prayer. There is no value as your value, Hashem our God, in this world. But there is nothing besides you, our King, in the next world. That's the prayer. There's no value like God in this world. And there's nothing besides you, our King, O God, in the next world. What this prayer is revealing, there's a fundamental difference between how this world operates and how the next world operates. Here, every person gets to decide what they want to do. That's the idea of, of free will, of free choice, of Bechira. Everyone can decide what's important and what's not important. But what we're discovering over here is that this is not some sort of isolated thing. Every time you have a question, should I do this, should I do that? You have to make a choice. The true choice is where you assign an internal totem pole of what's important, of what are your values, in descending order from the most important value, which is the top value, on downward. There's a certain internal hierarchy of values that's the underlying determining factor of all free will choices. When you have a choice, you have two options, and you decide which one of those two options you want to follow, you unconsciously are referring to your internal list to determine which of the, which one of these two options are a higher value, and thus you choose the one that's of a higher value. A free will choice is the question of trade-offs. You value this, you value that, you can only have one of them. And thus, when you choose, you're in effect merely exhibiting, manifesting, reflecting 
the pre-existing values hierarchy. What this means is, is that the, the key decision of what a person chooses is not at the time of the choice, but it's rather when you decide to, de- to determine to assign hierarchy to these values. Once those values are fixed in your internal totem pole, then the choices that you make regarding them are already predetermined. And thus, the question that we can ask is, you know, is God a value in our lives? Is it something which is important to us? Is it a priority? In this world that we live in, that is a choice that we have. We could choose to assign God a value, to assume that that is a priority in our lives, or we could choose to disregard that entirely. And every Shabbos morning and the prayer we say, there is no value like your value, Hashem our God, in this world. In this world that we get to choose how important things are, we're announcing to everyone that God is the top value. However, that's only in this world. When it comes to the next world, in the clarity of Olam Abba, we say is there is nothing besides you, our God, in Olam Abba. In Olam Abba, in the next world, not only is God the top value of the internal hierarchy, he is the only value. There is nothing besides you, our king, in Olam Abba. Our sages tell us, Abraham, and of course Isaac and Jacob as well, these were the people who managed to taste Olam Abba, to live with the same kinds of priorities as exist in the next world, even though they were still here. What Abraham did was he transformed what was important in his life. Not only did he say God's important, God's a priority, God's a value in my life. That was, of course, step one. Step two is to take this value and make it the highest value. Make it that you have to choose, if you have to choose between God and anything else, well, then you're going to refer to your internal hierarchy and say, well, God is more important. And therefore, if someone comes and puts a gun to your head, God forbid, and says, okay, either repudiate your faith or I'm going to shoot you. So in effect, you have a choice. What's the choice? The choice is between two values. Value A is God and your commitment to God. And value B is your life. Both of them are important. Which one is more important? When a person has to make that choice of martyrdom, in effect, they're declaring that God and their relation to God and the connection to the Almighty is more important to them than their lives. It's the highest priority. It's the only thing that triumphs over all other priorities. It's the highest value. That, of course, is the product of of rigorous self-reflection and transformation. That is what we're declaring as a nation every Shabbos morning. We say there's no value like Hashem or God. In this world, we can choose what's important, and we have chosen. God is the most important thing. That's an effect. Every Shabbos morning, we're declaring our willingness to forfeit our life for God. That's a great level. Abraham took it to the next level. Abraham was like the second part of that prayer where we say, there's nothing besides you, our king, in Olam Abba. In Olam Abba, in the next world, not only is God the top value, God is the only value. Nothing else has any independent value aside from God. There's only one value, and that is God. Abraham was able to access that in this world. And when we see that Abraham is being tested, let's say just tell us that Abraham was tested with 10 increasingly difficult tests. And in each one of them, he was successful. Each one of them, he triumphed. What this means is that Abraham had to choose what is important. The first test is Abraham has to choose between his life and God. And Abraham willingly chose to be cast into a fiery furnace and not to repudiate his amuna, his faith. And thereby, he demonstrated that he valued God more than his own life. And then we have these later tests. Abraham is told by God, to commit horrifyingly unkind and even barbaric acts, such as banishing his son Ishmael from his home and killing his other son in the episode of the Binding of Isaac. What these tests are designed to do is to discern if Abraham harbors any other value besides for God. 
And the way we ascertain the answer to that question is if God tells Abraham to do something egregiously unkind, even immoral, what does Abraham do? Is there any morsel of Abraham's priorities, Abraham's Weltanschauung, Abraham's worldview, Abraham's outlook, Abraham's priorities that originates from any source other than, than God? Is there any thing motivating Abraham besides for godly motivation? What do we see here with the test of the binding of Isaac? Abraham is demonstrating that even the most heinous crime imaginable, murder of his own son, even that was solely motivated because that's the will of God. That's the only priority. And thus, whatever God wills, whatever God desires, whatever God instructs, that's what matters. And therefore, if God tells me to go commit filicide, well, then it's the same as God tells me to do another mitzvah because after all, there's only one motivating factor. There's only one value. Abraham is living in the same priorities as our present in Olam Abba, and thus with the same eagerness, with the same excitement that he performed all his acts, he wakes up early in the morning, he harnesses his donkey, and he does the act with the same dedication, with the same determination, with the same gusto and excitement as he does everything. That's what we're discovering here, is that Abraham is someone whose totem pole whose values hierarchy is identical to what exists in Olam Abba, meaning there's only one priority and it's only God. So let's go back to this conversation that the Satan had with God. The Satan says, Abraham is celebrating. He's having this whole feast, but he's not offering a sacrifice. What the Satan is suggesting is that Abraham harbors some value, i.e. his love, his filial love for his son, that has nothing to do with God. He's celebrating, but not offering sacrifices. Maybe there is a scintilla of independent love, of natural love that every parent has for their child, even animals have for their children. Maybe that is what's motivating Abraham's behavior as evidenced by the fact that he's not offering sacrifices. Maybe this celebration was divorced of commitment to God. Maybe Abraham loves Isaac because he loves Isaac, because everyone loves their child. Maybe his actions are motivated by something aside from the will of God. And therefore God responds to him, no, 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 you you missed the point. Even when Abraham celebrated the weaning of his son Isaac, all that was motivated because of his love of God and because of his commitment to God. And I'll prove it to you. I'll prove to you that he does not love Isaac independent of the instruction of God. There's only one value in his tone of pole by showing you the greatest evidence of that by asking him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice for me. And indeed, Abraham is up to the test. He has no value. There's no priority in his life independent of God. And I think more broadly speaking, this is only the introduction to the story, but this is really the whole idea, the whole conflict that lies at the heart of Rosh Hashanah. We, too, have to assign for ourselves an internal totem pole of what's important. We, too, have a list of ranking, a hierarchy of what's important and what's next next important and and what, what things matter but are somewhat trivial. And our choices are, of course, reflections of that. Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. Rosh Hashanah is when our decisions and our choices are scrutinized. But on a deep level, the scrutiny is not limited to the isolated acts that we do, the choices, the sins, the mitzvahs that we do. It's who we are. It's what we value. What are our priorities in life? What is that internal hierarchy, that totem pole look like? Who is our master? Is God atop our totem pole? Is he even a value on our hierarchy? And of course, this is one of the themes that is threaded throughout the prayers of Rosh Hashanah. Are we subordinating ourselves to the pitiful king, to the Yetzirah, to the faux king, to the false king that's masquerading as the true master in lieu of the lofty king? That is the conflict that we're trying to arouse in our minds over the course of Rosh Hashanah to really examine what's important to us in our lives. And of course, Rosh Hashanah is the day that we're going to coronate God as the king, but we have to realize that in all likelihood, there's another false king 
that is sitting on God's throne, so to speak. That's the eight Sarah. The Talmud tells us that there's a foreign God within each and every one of us, and that is the eight Sahara. That is the force that says, what I think is important is really important. That's the force that gets us to sin. A sin, in, in effect, is a deliberate and willful repudiation of, of the dominion of God. And thus, anytime we sin, in effect, we're disregarding God's monarchy, God's hegemony, God's dominion. And Abraham here, he's the paradigmatic example of someone who made God supreme over himself. He was one who said that, no, atop his hierarchy sits just God. And in fact, Abraham is a much higher level. He's showing us the most superlative example of someone who is making God supreme. And there's no greater story than the story of the Binding of Isaac to show what it means when someone really values God to the exclusion of any other value. So what happens? Abraham is given this instruction. He wakes up early in the morning. He himself saddles his donkey. Rashi tells us, even though Abraham had lots of people to work for him, when he is so in love with the will of God, with the commandment of God, it caused him to act weirdly to even saddle his own donkey. And the donkey is going to play a big part of the whole story, apparently. He takes his two young men with him, and Isaac, his son, so there's four people traveling. Who are these four people? Abraham and Isaac, of course, and Ishmael and Eliezer, Abraham's trusty confidant. He takes the wood for the offering that's going to be the wood for the altar, and they travel to the place where God has spoken to him. The intention is that Abraham is going to go with three others, but is going to return with only two after Isaac is offered as a sacrifice. Now, in the Midrash, we find out that this donkey that is being used to help transport all the paraphernalia for the binding of Isaac, it actually has an interesting backstory and and future history ahead of it. This donkey, our sages tell us, was created in the twilight of Friday to Saturday, Friday to Shabbos, of the first week of creation. And the Talmud lists 10 things that are these hybrids that are half spiritual, half physical. The donkey of Abraham, we're told, was created in that twilight zone between Friday and and Shabbos, between the physical, the mundane, and the spiritual. That's that donkey. It's an old donkey. And Abraham wrote on it, In addition, we're told that this same donkey was ridden on by Moses when Moses descended to Egypt to go see the Jewish people. He took his family, his wife and his two sons, and he made them ride on a donkey. Aristides tells us that's the same donkey. And finally, in the future, Scripture tells us that the King Messiah is going to ride on a donkey. He's going to be to quote scripture, a poor person riding on a donkey, and that is going to be his means of transportation, apparently, to go save the Jewish people. Now, what is the meaning behind this, that there's this multi-thousand-year-old donkey that is going to be ridden by all these great leaders, by Abraham, by Moses, by Messiah, to go save the Jewish people? It seems very bizarre. So there's a general motif in Jewish literature that whenever it talks about a donkey— It's a manifestation of a certain idea, and that is the idea of physicality. In fact, the Hebrew word for donkey is chamor, and the Hebrew word for physicality is chomer. It's the same root, because the donkey is the ultimate embodiment of physicality. And this really gets to the general conflict of life. What is the role of our physical orientation, our physical existence in our life? Is it a tool to achieve our spiritual objectives, or is it an end unto its own? In other words, is the man riding the donkey, is the soul, is the spiritual agenda harnessing the physicality to use it to achieve its objectives, or is the donkey riding on the man? Are we taking what should be a tool to aid us in our spiritual journey, and we're transforming that into the goal of life itself? If we zone in on the Eight Sahara, on the evil connection, and to understand exactly what its job is, how does it cause us to sin? Our sages tell us that its modus operandi 
is to weaponize the physicality and to transform what truly is a tool, a dante, a means of transportation to the goal, which is the spiritual goal, that is being transformed by the Yetzara into the goal itself. What our sages are telling us, that Abraham, Moses, Messiah are riding on the donkey, what they're revealing to us, that there were three people who were total masters over their donkey. And by dint of that, because they had completely harnessed and reined in their physicality, their soul was totally in control over their animalistic instincts. Consequently, they got rid of the Eight Sahara's influence. Only God was their master, and thus they were able to undertake these missions that reshaped the world. And of course, this is, again gets back to the theme of Rosh Hashanah. It's the standoff. We have the lofty king and the pitiful king. What does it look like when someone is totally subservient to the lofty king? To God? It looks like Abraham traveling on the donkey. He's totally in control. He's in charge of determining which direction the collective being goes. It's the soul who's riding on the donkey, not vice versa. And, of course, that is what we aspire to instead of being beshackled to the pitiful king, to the Eight Sahara. So they arrive at the mountain after three days of traveling. And Rashi tells us the reason why it was three days, why wasn't it faster? Because if it was right away, if it was instantaneously, you may suggest or you may question, you may say, well, Abraham was in the throes of religious passion and therefore he jumped into the fire. He acted unwisely because he didn't have time to think about it. But now Abraham has three days to chew over, to mull, to ruminate over what he's about to do. And nevertheless, he stands by steadfastly with his decision to obey the will of God. After three days, Abraham raises his eyes. He sees the place from afar. And he tells Ishmael and Eliezer, stay here by yourselves with donkey. Me, I, and the lad, and Isaac, we're going to travel, we're going to worship, and we will return to you. Our sages tell us that they got to the mountain and they saw that there was a cloud hovering over the mountain. Abraham saw it, Isaac saw it, but Ishmael and Eliezer, they did not see it. And then he says to them, you stay here with the donkey. And the way it's interpreted by our sages is that you're no better than the donkey. You are not seeing the world with your spiritual eyeballs, with your spiritual senses. Your vision is clouded by the donkey. You're like the donkey. You are enmeshed, absorbed in your physicality, and therefore you don't see what's patently evident in the spiritual world. You stay here. We're going to go. This is a mission only for people that are not subject to the donkey, and you stay here with the donkey. So Abraham takes the wood and puts it on Isaac. Isaac is schlepping it. They have the fire. They have the knife. And they have all the paraphernalia to do the sacrifice. And they start ascending the mountain together. Now, it's interesting that we know that this donkey is carrying all the paraphernalia to the mountain. Three days they're traveling and they have this donkey for the help for helping transport the people and the goods needed for the sacrifice. Yet when they start ascending the mountain, they leave Ishmael and Eliezer together with the donkey and they manually, by hand, are carrying the wood, are carrying the fire, are carrying the knife. And the question that the Maharal asks is, I don't get it. Why doesn't Abraham take the donkey to help schlep up all the provisions? Why does he put the wood on Isaac and he himself is carrying the fire and the knife? Doesn't it make sense to use a donkey to help transport the paraphernalia up the mountain? And the idea is that there are times where you have to totally shed your inner donkey. It's a very deep idea here. Abraham, he was in total control over his physicality. Total control. Yet what he's going to do right now He's going to not only be the master over his physicality, he's going to shed his physicality entirely. This is going to be a mission where Abraham's going to ascend to the level of an angel. 
someone who doesn't have this proverbial donkey. And therefore, yes, you'll come back, you'll return to it. But this is a commune with God, Abraham, like an angel. Isaac, like an angel. The donkey, it's going to stay there with Eliezer and with Ishmael. Even if you're in control of the donkey, there's a time for you to ascend above that and live like an angel. And we know that on Rosh Hashanah and subsequently Yom Kippur, it's a time that we wear white. Of course, that's supposed to evoke the feeling of our perhaps pending demise. Our sages tell us that you wear white as white as the garments that we wrapped. The, the dead and the burial shrouds are, are white. But another idea is, is that the angels are white. The angels symbolize purity. They symbolize total cleansing of sin. And there's this idea that on Rosh Hashanah, we're going to ascend to a higher level. We're going to be restored, so to speak, to the original Rosh Hashanah. The original Rosh Hashanah, where it was just Adam and Eve, and they had a palpable, visceral connection with God. That's what we're trying to recreate on Rosh Hashanah. My grandfather would tell us that there is a sublime feeling of God's dominion that is perceptible on Rosh Hashanah. Particularly, he said, during the Musaf prayer, during the second prayer of, of the morning, and during the blowing of the shofar. It's a time where we take our donkeys, we take our, all our history that we have, the whole physical, all that baggage that we're living with the whole year, and we leave it behind. We don't take it with us. We're ascending the mountain like Abraham. We're going to, for one day, be like that angel. For one day, be like the idyllic human living in this utopian panacea. Everything is great. Everything is wonderful. We're like an angel. We're like a soul. And now's the time when we're in that state to examine again, to remember, to reflect what exactly we're living for. What kind of life do we want to have? And we remind ourselves, we want to be remembered for life. What kind of life? A life of living for God, a life embodied by Abraham. It's a very potent idea here that we see in the story. Abraham, he's traveling with the donkey, he's riding the donkey, he's the master of the donkey. His physicality is subordinate to him. Yet when he goes up to a undertake this mission, he ascends the mountain, he leaves that behind. He becomes a different person. He becomes like an angel. He becomes someone totally unrelated, unconnected to the physicality. And now he's able to have this moment with God and to achieve this this apex of, of human greatness. So along the way, there is a fateful conversation between Abraham and Isaac In fact, this is the only recorded conversation in the Torah between Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac tells Abraham, okay, we have the fire, we have the wood. Where is the lamb? Where is the animal? I don't see it. There's a missing ingredient for our sacrifice. So Abraham tells him, God is going to show us the lamb. But if not, then you're going to take its place. And the two of them went together. Rashi tells us that this shows us not only... Abraham's poise, Abraham's greatness and willingness to commit this mitzvah, but also it shows us Isaac's greatness. Isaac, our other forefather, the fact that he is willingly going to do the will of God, even though his father is about to sacrifice him, still he is totally calm and able to walk together with Abraham. Both of them are united. They arrive at the place which God had spoken to them. This, of course, is Mount Moriah, called Temple Mount. It is the plateau behind the western wall in Jerusalem. Abraham builds the altar, arranges the wood. He binds Isaac so Isaac does not move. And he is wielding the knife to slaughter his son. And at the very last moment, the angel calls out to him and says, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't stretch out your head against your lad. Don't kill him. So Abram's like, okay, well, let me at least make some sort of notch, some indentation, some wound. No, nor do anything to him. For now I know that you are a God-fearing man, since you have not withheld your son, your only one, from me. There was a whole sacrifice about to take place. And at the very last moment, God tells Abraham, no, you have to stop the sacrifice and you cannot touch Isaac. 
And Abraham lifts his eyes, and behold, he sees a ram. The ram is caught up in the thicket by its horns, and Abraham goes and takes the ram and replaces Isaac with the lamb and sacrifices it and offers it as an offering. And Abraham renames the mountain Hashem Yira'eh, means God will appear on the mountain that God will be seen. So this ram also has a very long history. The Midrash tells us that every single part of this lamb is going to be used for a grand purpose. Like that donkey, it too was created on the twilight zone between Friday and Shabbos of the first week of creation. Its ashes, because after Abraham sacrificed that he, he burned it, its ashes are going to be used for the foundation of the internal altar. Its sinews, its veins are going to be used to make the strings of David's harp. Its skin, its hide was going to be used for garments for Elijah. Its horns, the left horn was used to blow the shofar at Sinai and the right horn is going to be used to blow the shofar heralding the arrival of the Messiah and the coronation of God over the whole world. In addition, Rashi tells us that Abraham discovers this ram, but the ram was actually there placed since the first week of creation. It's an amazing insight. For thousands of years, there was the ram there caught up in the thicket, trapped over there, struggling to try to disentangle from the thicket since the beginning of time. And it was waiting for its moment. Many thousands of years later, Abraham comes and this ram is brought as a sacrifice instead of Isaac. Now, I heard this past year an amazing insight. If you think about this whole story from the perspective of the ram and the way it's told in our sages, the ram is created right after Adam's created, beginning of time, and it's placed in the thicket, and it's struggling for thousands of years. And the whole time, it's probably thinking to itself, I'm totally trapped. I'm totally caught up in this thicket. I want to disentangle. I want to run away. I want to go do something with my life. And for thousands of years, it's struggling. But what it doesn't realize is that, no, it's not trapped. It's not stuck. It's been positioned to go through this struggle to achieve one of the most important events in in all of Torah and to have this tremendous legacy to be a tool to bring about salvation in all kinds of ways for the Jewish people over all kinds of times in its history. Its role is going to be so outsized and it had no idea that the struggle that it was in was not it being trapped, rather it being positioned for its destiny. And I think this could apply to every one of us. Every one of us, we're going through difficult times. Everyone's going through difficult times because if you're not, then you're not alive. Being alive means you're struggling. We're like the ram. We're caught up in the thicket. We're tangled up. We're struggling and we don't realize that it's not that we're trapped. Rather, God is positioning us to do whatever it is we need to do. And I think that's also a very valuable lesson in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a time where you take an accounting. What am I living for? What has my past year been? And what are my aspirations for the future? How am I utilizing the opportunities and, dare we say, the challenges that God gives us to achieve whatever it is my mission in life is? And we have to recognize, like this ram, the circumstances are not by chance. God did not trap me in all these different areas in these quagmires, randomly, I'm being positioned, I'm being set up to achieve whatever it is that the Almighty has in store for me. Whatever it is my mission, I'm being manipulated and directed and maneuvered to achieve that goal. And this ram, of course, it's it's an animal. It had no idea what its role was. And again, the, the Midrash is revealing to us a very powerful insight. It's been there for thousands of years. What that means, who knows? But from our perspective, what this means is, is that this ram is set up 
to achieve a very powerful destiny and the whole time it didn't know of it. And it took thousands of years and endless struggles and endless efforts to try to get out of the thicket. And only then did it make sense that only then did all those puzzle pieces fit together and its mission was revealed to the world and it has this great legacy. Now, the episode of the Binding of Isaac is referenced several times throughout Rosh Hashanah. So, for example, in the prayer that we say during the Musaf prayer, we tell God, remember us with a good memory, redeem us with salvation, with mercy from the high heavens above, and remember Hashem our God, the covenant and the kindness and the oath that you swore to Abraham on Mount Moriah, and let it be seen before you the arcade of the binding that Abraham bound Isaac, his son, atop the altar, and he overcame, he conquered his mercy to do your will with a complete heart. So too, may you have your mercy conquer your anger from upon you, and with your great goodness, may the anger be removed from upon your nation and from upon your city, from upon your land, and from upon your heritage. Abraham had a tendency. He loved his son. He curbed that. He overcame that to do the will of God. We're asking God, you too have a tendency or, or an attribute of judgment. When someone sins, it evokes judgment. Overcome that exactly the way Abraham overcame his and rule us favorably with mercy, with goodness, and with kindness. Abraham renames the mountain Har Yerah. But the words are, Abraham called the name of the site Hashem Yerah, as it is said this day on the mountain that Hashem will be seen. What does it mean this day? So Rashi quotes in Midrash. Every single day, every single year, this episode, the episode of the Binding of Isaac, will be used as a means to atone, to expiate the Jewish people from their sins, to save them from punishment. And thus every year and every generation and every day on this mountain, God will appear because Abraham did this grand act of martyrdom and Isaac did as well. There's another verse in Leviticus chapter 26 where God says, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, I will remember. So Rashi points out, quoting from our sages in the Talmud, that it mentions God remembering the covenant of Jacob, remembering the covenant with Abraham. But with Isaac, it doesn't say God will remember the covenant with Isaac, rather, and also the covenant with Isaac. But there is no word for memory for God remembering the covenant with Isaac. Now, of course, whenever we talk about God remembering, it doesn't imply that God forgets or anything like that. It's a separate subject. What does it mean that God remembers? And we see every time that it mentions God's memory, it means God evoking the righteousness of a certain person. But it doesn't have the term remember with respect to Isaac. And Rashi, quoting from Mercedes, asked the question, why does it not mention, I will remember the covenant of Jacob. I will remember the covenant of Isaac, and I'll remember the covenant of Abraham. It says, it says, I'll remember Jacob and Abraham, but not Isaac. And the answer is that with Isaac, there is no need to have this memory, this remembrance of Isaac, because the ashes of Isaac are always piled up and placed upon the altar and before God. It's a very powerful idea here. Isaac was not ultimately offered as a sacrifice at the Binding of Isaac episode. But what was accomplished here was as if he was. And thus, this is extended as if Abraham actually sacrificed Isaac and burned him. And there's the ashes of Isaac and this tremendous act of martyrdom as if it was done. And that is placed before God. In our nation, having this continuity and having the judgment every year, we're evoking this episode and we're being successful at being able to be granted 
atonement by God because of this tremendous story of our forebearers. In fact, Abraham, he prayed on Mount Moriah. We say many times throughout the high holidays season, God who answered Abraham on Mount Moriah, answer us. If you actually look at the episode, it doesn't really seem to talk about Abraham's prayer. The only thing we have is that Abraham called the name of the site Hashem Yira'eh. Hashem will appear on this mountain. And the Talmud explains that what this means is that Abraham's prayer was that every time we mention and we evoke the story of the binding of Isaac, it will be an atonement for the Jewish people. And thus, this story, of course, it's very appropriate for us to read it on Rosh Hashanah to, A, remember the tremendous achievement and overcoming of tendencies of Abraham, but also to evoke the concomitant kindness and mercy that this story spurs. Now, it's not just us reading the story that is trying to evoke this episode. The Talmud tells us, why do we blow the shofar of a ram? We could use many other animals' horns as a shofar and it would be okay. But why specifically is there a custom to use the shofar of an ayel, the shofar of a ram? Says the Talmud, the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 16a, because the Almighty is saying, so to speak, if you use the shofar of a ram, blow it, and I will remember the binding of Isaac, the son of Abraham, and I will treat you as if you yourself offered yourself as a sacrifice before me. It's an amazing insight here, amazing opportunity that we're, we're discovering here, that the actions of Abraham thousands of years ago, if we just merely evoke it, if we just dwell upon the story, we're going to be able to unlock the tremendous merit as if we ourselves offered ourselves as sacrifice. What an amazing insight. Now, the reading ends with a little bit of an odd postscript. So Abraham, he has this prayer. The angel appears and says to him, you know, Abraham, you proved yourself. And he gives him tremendous blessings. And finally, Abraham returns to his young men, to to Eliezer and Ishmael. They travel to Beersheba. He lives in Beersheba. And then the chapter ends that sometime later, Abraham was told that his brother Nachar had a bunch of children. With his wife, he had eight children. And with his concubine, he had four children. And that's the end of the reading where we delineate the 12 sons, the 12 nephews of Abraham. And one of those nephews is Bisuel, and he's the father of Rebekah. Of course, Rebekah is going to marry Isaac. So Rashi tells us that the whole lineage of Abraham's brother Nachar is all there to tell us the pedigree of Rebekah. That's what Rashi says. But I've got a different idea. You know, Abraham, he spends 70 some odd years with his wife and they're childless. And at the age of 99, he has one son. And what a celebration. And then 37 years later, that same one son is brought as a sacrifice. Or at least is, Abram has to go through the motions as if he's being brought as a sacrifice. And then you have this contrast, this very stark contrast between Abraham's children, Abraham's progeny, and his brother, Nachor's progeny. He has 12 sons, no problems, no drama. And we have this tremendous contrast. Abraham chose one path, the path of being God's chosen, the path that resulted in everything that ensued. He had one son after many, many years of childlessness. And even that same son had this horrifying, terrifying brush with death. And his brother, it seems like he chose a different path, but it looked like it worked out much better for him. He has 12 sons. He's got the whole empire. Abraham chose to change himself, to live with a purpose, to live, to die for God, to change the world. Nachar went with a flow. On the surface, it looks like Nachar had it better. Things went more easily for him. But ultimately, what do we have when we compare the two legacies? Abraham, of course, changed the world. Abraham is the most 
transformative person to ever grace this planet? And who's Nachar? Besides for his redeeming granddaughter Rebecca, there really nothing amounted from all his 12 children. We read in the Parsha recently, Behold, I place before you two options. There's life, there's good, and there's death and evil. There's two choices before us. And the Midrash tells us something fascinating. The Midrash says, you have a man who comes to a fork in the road, and there's two choices. One path looks very clear. It's very open. It's very pleasant. There's nothing blocking your path forward. There's no obstacles. There's no hazards in your way. The second path looks very difficult. You have to maneuver it very carefully. You have to navigate to avoid the pitfalls, to avoid the hazards, to avoid the dangers. And of course, every one of us would want to opt for the easier path. But there is a wise person there and tells the individual, the path to your right looks very difficult. You have all kinds of dangers, but it's only difficult for a little bit. Once you get past that initial stage, it gets very easy and very pleasant. And thus, you'd be best advised to choose that path. Whereas the other path, which seems very open, very pleasant, very welcoming, very easy and very friendly, it's only like that for a little bit. And once you get through the initial ease, you're going to encounter mounting difficulties and danger and hazards. That's the two choices that were before Abraham and before Nachar. And we see what happens here. Abraham chooses the more difficult path. He chooses the path that resulted in him having a very difficult life, having to make very difficult decisions. And the most difficult one we just went through. Nachar chose the other path. And looks like he has it very easy. But ultimately we know one of them changed the world. One of them created a movement that burgeoned into the single most transformative moments in history. And the other one of them, besides for his granddaughter that latched on to the family of Abraham, really had nothing to show for that. And I think that's a good idea to reflect on Rosh Hashanah. Our life, of course, we're given two options. There's this king and there's that king. There's the lofty king, there's God, and there's the pitiful king, there's the Yitzhara. There's the donkey, are we going to ride it? Are we going to have it ride us? Are we going to choose to focus on the life that brings us to our spiritual completion and use everything in the world as a tool, as an aid to get there? Are we going to take the path that initially seems very easy, very pleasant, very welcoming, but ultimately results not only in tremendous difficulty, but ultimately in our spiritual downfall? That's the question we have to think about in Rosh Hashanah. And my hope is that all of us take the time, this Rosh Hashanah, when we read the readings, when we do the prayers, when we do the various omens that we do, everything about the entire day, the entire two days, is oriented around getting us in the zone to have this moment of reflection, to have this time to evaluate, to think about what's our priorities, what are we living for, what is the goal, what does my internal hierarchy, my totem pole of values, what does it look like? And hopefully, once we're done the Rosh Hashanah, we could say, like the whole Jewish nation says together, there is no value like you are Shemar God in this world, in this world, when we have the choices, we have the options, we have the right, we have the left. We have the Abraham path, we have the Nahor path. We have these choices. Which king do we want to subject ourselves to? When we have those choices, we're going to declare on Rosh Hashanah, when we say HaMelech, we say God's the king, we're going to declare Hashem, our God, we choose to place you atop our hierarchy. We choose to give you the crown of glory. May we all be blessed with a Shana Tova Matuka, a happy, healthy, sweet new year. Aksiva Chazima Tova, we should be inscribed and stamped swiftly into the book of life, into the book of total righteousness. And may we celebrate another year of tremendous Torah growth together. My email address is rabbiwolwajima.com. Have a fantastic Rosh Hashanah and a wonderful year.